Asterion was going to be a tiefling. What? No, don't you dare. This isn't funny. And one of the most compelling villains was actually potentially going to be a companion in Baldur's Gate 3. When my life was dismantled piece by piece, and when I tried to buy it back, it cost me everything. Everything. That and more was part of a long ranging talk spanning from the GDC presentation called The Secrets of Baldur's Gate 3 and an hour long interview after that with IGN. This was the same place where Sven announced that Larian would be scrapping plans for BG3 DLC or even a Baldur's Gate 4 and moving on to their own thing. The interview itself is a wealth of so, so much information, and it sounds like it might be all that we're going to get given this recent tweet from Sven. You know, reading this tweet, it looks like a, it looks a bit like the head of Larian is, is kind of done with interviews for the moment, with a hefty workload back at the studio to cover. But for the time being, let's reminisce and join in on some, some of the most juicy details that we got about the development of Baldur's Gate 3 and the things that could have been in the game. At this point, I think we're all going to be very familiar with Neil Newbin's incredible performance as Asterion, the High Elf Vampire. But would it have all landed the same way if Asterion had been a tiefling? Originally, he was. A tiefling with slicked back black hair and glowing yellow eyes, to be exact. Something Sven actually showed at GDC and expanded on in the interview with IGN. I think it was, I don't actually remember 100%, but I think we just wanted to have diversity among the races, and so that's how he became a tiefling. He kind of sounded cool, a tiefling vampire, and so for a while he was like that. But then he didn't really resonate that strongly as a companion, and so that's how he came to be who he is now. It's an interesting turn of events as the eventual game would actually have a, a lot and an abundance of tieflings in it from all over the place, but also a very specific tiefling that would end up being one of your companions and one that I think resonates quite a bit more with that choice. And that's, of course, Carlac. Good stories, good sex, life itself. They all share the element of unpredictability. Settle in. It sounds like all the iterations that Asterion went through were part of the process, the hashing out of his story, all from the core components and his seductive nature, as well as a bit of Neil Newbin's indirect influence just because, well, he's Neil. And just to clarify here, there is nothing in the interview that states that it was Neil that had any direct direct uh, cause on this change, just more about like his performance and, and the way that he was when he was picked and everything about it, kind of led to being able to flesh out Asterion's character a bit more. He, he basically fit into the role and expanded the role with who he was, which I assume could be said for all of the actors who brought themselves into the characters, because that's kind of how it works. And now I don't think we could look at any of them in any different way than they were in this game, because they have they put forth such iconic performances. And speaking of iconic performances, one of them could have had an expanded role. I'll tell you a story, true soul. One of the possible companions we came close to getting was a bit of a surprise. The tormented villain who you almost feel sorry for, Catherick Thorm. So if you play the game, there's a moment where you can convince him and you can see that in that moment where he breaks, that moment led to recruitment normally. He was supposed to be in your camp while you were dealing with Gortash and with Orin. So he became a source of information with them and he could trust. You could get him to his arc. He could then be convinced to go to this side. So it was a great story. But yeah, if you played through the story, which I mean, fuck, I really hope so, because that was a huge spoiler in this. I mean, not like not the biggest spoiler, but still a pretty big spoiler. At least I didn't say anything about Baldur's Gate. But there was definitely a moment, a moment in all the interactions you have where you could tell where there was a break, where there was a, a moment where you think if the game had gone that direction, you could definitely have convinced Kether to go a different way to to perhaps join you. The, the legacy of those choices resonate in those scenes. And I think thinking about it that way now 
actually adds, it adds a bit of sadness to it. Because after all, don't we all just love having a, a, a redemption story and to, to, to realize that we were close to being able to get that, but then not actually getting it, I think makes the story a little bit more sorrowful but I think it still worked out best in the end doing it this way. It also sounds, just to clarify, because some places are reported as like a playable companion, it doesn't sound that way from what's, at least to me, what, what Sven is saying here. It sounds more like a uh, a Duke Raven Guard type uh, companion, you know, someone just in your camp who you can talk to and gives you information, helps you along, has different in interactions and conversations with other parts of your, your party. But yeah, it, it's just, it's still a think it could have been a really interesting thing, but I, I understand why. This is just one of the many darlings they had to kill, which really goes to show just how much of a, a refining process making a game like this is. Reading the interview and all about the things they went through, I can't help but think to my own process in writing, how similar it feels and sounds and resonates. The tough cuts you have to make, the changes from your original idea to the final product, and how at times that can make an old idea feel completely alien. Larian was weaving a tale for us that could have been very different if not for some of the key decisions they made along the way. Some of the key cuts. One of those monumental cuts happens to be all about locations. From what Sven said in the interview, there was originally several locations you were supposed to visit but never did, including literal hell. Well, I guess, I mean, you kind of do visit hell, literally, twice, but it's definitely more brief than I think that they're, what, what Sven is talking about here. But also Vlacketh's Palace on the Gith Plain, as well as Candlekeep, where Baldur's Gate 1 first began. But before you go off on a tangent imagining all this incredible cut content, this was a different iteration, a smaller iteration, where the maps were not as large as they became. I think to some extent, like the rest of the things here, this worked out to be the best. While more location diversity would have been appreciated, especially in a sprawling Act 3, there is still a great deal you get out of the game, little vignettes of locations within the larger tapestry and it sounds like there was a good reason why. The sense of exploration wasn't really present, so that's why we killed a whole bunch of them. All of this in the interview and the talk and everything, I think is part of how Larian is bringing closure to themselves and to fans of the game that Larian will not be continuing with a DLC or a, a fourth uh, Baldur's Gate 4. But that doesn't mean they're completely done with Baldur's Gate 3 yet. And there's two major things that were mentioned in the interview that I think will will make some of you a little bit happy over what's to come for Baldur's Gate 3 still from Larian. The first is, of course, talking about mod support. We are working with Wizards, Sony, Microsoft, a lot of partners to align, but we're trying to get cross platform curated mods in there so that people on console can enjoy the mods that are being made for the PC also. So that'll be a big thing, I think because there's a lot of mods already, and then we won't be able to support everything, but we should be able to support quite a share. For those of you waiting for mod support, I think that's gonna be very exciting to hear, but I hadn't even considered or thought of mods from PC being used on, on, on consoles. So I think that's a really cool thing, and a really cool little, little tidbit there from the interview. Another cool little tidbit, or, or wicked uh, tidbit here, is about another ending that we're gonna get. We have a bunch of big features that are still in development, haven't been released that were on our roadmap since day one and still wanted to make them. So there's stuff. You're not going to see massive content changes though. So there's still epilogue work being done. So we committed after seeing feedback from players that we were going to give each ending a full cinematic treatment. It takes time. So they're working on the evil endings right now. I've seen some of them, they're really evil. So the evil players will be satisfied with that. So there's a bunch of work still going on on that front, but as time progresses, we're going to scale down. It's just going to be support on bugs. We want the team to be working on new things. So in that sense, the closure will be complete also. I think that's a good way to wrap it up for this video. But if you're sitting there just thinking, oh, you know, just all the evil ways that you could end Baldur's Gate 3 and what accompanying cinematics might look like, well then maybe you should watch this video right here 
right? So I, I look at how just how freaking evil you all are. It's pretty bad. It's pretty, pretty freaking dark. My name is Red Flynn. Thank you so, so much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.